There is a mystery unfolding in the world these days. The big political divisions of the past have faded. The left and the right, whatever these terms mean, seem to more and more agree on the fundamentals. So almost everywhere in the Western world, left and right agree that we should have a mixed economy. They agree that we should have a welfare state and they agree that the state should intervene in key sectors on the economy. So what we would expect is that as the political differences are shrinking, we would expect that the political atmosphere would be more calm. We would expect that political passions would be at a low. And yet we experience something different. We experience toxicity, we experience partisanship, and we experience a demonization of the other side. So here is the question we're going to try to answer. Why is it that although it looks like we are fighting more and more on less, why is it that it looks like we fight more and more over less and less? And the answer will be given today in New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. And with me today is my colleague, Ben Bayer. So, Ben, why is the public sphere these days so toxic? Well, the question of the, what the ultimate cause is, is something I think we'll explore throughout the episode today. But it's good, I think, to get started on thinking just about what effect we're trying to explain. Because I think you're right, that it, it does look like there's more and more fighting over less and less. And it's, it's unquestionable that the way you put it was we have a toxic uh, level of political discourse. And I think that's, as a kind of metaphor, uh, pretty good and pretty accurate to what we see. I mean, one thing we see, for instance, is that there are areas of life which were once blissfully free from politics, where politics is now infiltrated. You're being pushed at different, different uh, companies and different movies and television shows are, are being pushed to include politics in their agenda. You know, for everything from the music you listen to, uh, the, the Super Bowl game you watch, the shaving cream that you use, have, these have all been uh, hijacked into one kind of political controversy or another, depending upon the kinds of st stances that these products or uh, uh, forms of content take with regard to some of the political footballs of the day. Um, at the same time, you also have, even, even as there's more political controversy, there's also less substantive policy debate. There's, no, there's not substantive discussion about the merits, the pros, the cons of different policy positions. Uh, instead, it's more like nose counting. Who is on what we judge to be the right side? Who is on the wrong side? No discussion to be had about it. A lot of, I think, what uh, goes under the heading of quote unquote cancel culture uh, can be understood this way. Uh, there's less room for discussion about the merits of a position, more immediately uh, jumping on a bandwagon to, uh, uh, in one way or another, uh, blacklist or disassociate with the people who have the allegedly wrong views. Um, what goes hand in hand with that, I think, is also uh, a obsession over personalities as opposed to over idea obsession or dispute or debate about ideas. Often it's not even so much the policy positions that politicians take, but the personal character attributes that are stand-ins for whether you uh, want to vote for them or vote against them. Do we love them or do we hate them as people for their, uh, their flaws or for their alleged virtues as, uh, as people? Not what are their ideas? What do they want to do with the country? What, are they, what is their vision for the country? And, and then what, unfortunately, the, the result of all of this toxicity, I think, for our political climate is increasing resort to violence. After all, if you're not going to have debates uh, based on ideas about what is right and what is wrong on matters of policy, all that's left is really to resort to fighting it out in the streets. And I think we've seen that at a, a new high over the last 30 years, at least. I mean, I think the 60s were worse, but uh, in the last 
five years or so, we've seen the Black Lives Matter riots in the streets of America, and we've seen the January 6th uh, insurrection at the steps of the Capitol. And this is a new low for American politics and controversies about American politics when Americans can only see fighting in the streets, in effect, as, as the only way to resolve their political differences. So here's how I view the, the problem these days, Ben. So how should politics normally, how should political allegiance normally operate? We would start with, let's say I have these values, and then I look, which is the, the party or the group, the network, the side, the milieu that has these values, and then I join this side. These days, something else seems to be happen. Actually, the exact opposite. It seems to be, which is my group? First, I join a group, and then based on which group I join, then we kind of figure out what are our values. And here's a proof that this thing is happening. We see quite often a particular group, a particular side, as we'll call them a particular tribe, having contradictory views and contradictory uh, takes on different issues. For example, we have seen the left for years talking about racism, talking about microaggressions, talking about the pressure that is put to groups that feel that they are threatened and they are hated. And yet we see the left either turning a blind eye or actually initiating attacks against Jewish people that you'd expect that they would respect them and that they would at least care about them as being a minority which is uh, under, uh, under attack. Or we see the right talking about patriotism. We see the right talking about that we have become a soft society and uh, if something uh, important happens where we need to stand up to some evil, then we will uh, fold. And how do these same people, which keep talking about, oh, we need a brave man, we need a hard men to create good times. When they see a country like Ukraine standing up to an aggression, when we see Ukrainian men and women going to fight and to die for their country, what do they say? They say, ah, Ukraine should capitulate and this is the West Falls which is sending uh, money to Zelensky and uh, this is not a patriotic war. So we see the group standing first and then any and, and then there is no actual concern for values. So how do we call the phenomenon where instead of being principles first and then people, it's people first and then principles, or put differently, people first and reality second, this is tribalism. Tribalism is when you judge the world not based on your rational judgment based on some reality-based principles. For example, I believe in individual rights and patriotism and de de defending your country if it's a free country. Therefore, I will have this, uh, this, this standard and apply it to every situation. No, the standard is who is involved in this situation? Oh, it's uh, Zelensky who the other side is uh, loving. Therefore, I'm going to hate on Zelensky. So tribalism is, I judge myself others and the world through the prism of the group, not through the prism of reality. So spoiler alert, I think this is the main phenomenon that we're getting at today, that it is tribalism that is behind the toxicity that we see in the public sphere. So what I described is an abstraction, Ben. Let's now see how it operates in particular case studies. And one case study you want to talk about is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a few examples already, but I think it's worth really digging into a few case studies to see just the extent to which uh, tribalistic political pressures influence people's thinking on politics, especially with regard to some very recent, very hot controversies. Israel versus Hamas is one of them. I should say for the first two case studies we're going to look at, we're going to see how there's tribalism just on one side of the political spectrum. This is not to say it's not on the other. Well, if we have time, we'll get to a third where we'll talk about it on both. But for the Israel versus Palestine conflict, this is a case where you especially see, I think, tribalism on the left to the point that it, it's influenced and it's affected a lot of people's lives. I mean, they, the left wing protesters who are supporters of Palestine have staged huge mass protests on the streets of London, uh, New York, other major American cities, 
shutting down roads, shutting down bridges. Uh, that's the kind of tribalism that you can't, you can't unsee once, once it's gotten in your way. And the question is, well, what makes it tribalism? It's not simply that people are getting together in groups on the streets. It's the way they are evidently thinking about the problem that they are protesting. So you especially see this in what appear to be double standards that these activists have. Uh, absence of a double standard, or sorry, the presence of a double standard reveals the absence of a, of a genuine principled stand. Uh, and, and especially if we're just talking about the followers and not the leaders, I'll say something about that in a minute. But think about the uh, think about the case that the activists make against Israel on behalf of Palestine. Their complaint, of course, is that the Palestinians, they live in occupied territories. They are allegedly oppressed, victims of injustice. Uh, Israel is the, perp the perpetrator, alleged to be the perpetrator. But you don't see the same kind of concern about victims of injustice if we're talking about the uh, you know, thousands of uh, Arab victims of the, serial, the Syrian civil war, you don't see the same kind of uh, solidarity expressed with protesters in Iran who are also victims of injustice. You, and you don't especially see it really against the, the, the Palestinians themselves when they are made the victim of the Hamas regime. So that suggests it's not really some kind of principled concern for injustice that's motivating the uh, anti-Israel protesters. Um, I think you also see this in the fact that, well, there are a lot of people who have the little, you mentioned Ukraine uh, previously in the way that the right thinks about it, Nikos, but if you think about the way the left thinks about it, you see there's further evidence here because while you see a lot of people who have that little Ukrainian flag on their Twitter profile, there's not too many that have the Ukrainian flag and the flag of Israel. Uh, they, they're, they're likely to be supporters of Ukraine, but, but not so much of Israel against Hamas. Uh, they, so they oppose Russian against, uh, aggression against Ukraine, but don't come out swinging against a, Hamas's aggression of Israel. That's when I think you can make the case, at least, that the, it's more obvious that Israel is a victim of aggression than that Ukraine is. I mean, both Ukraine and Israel have occupied territories where there's allegations that the Ukraine and Israel are unjustified occupiers, the Donbass region in the east of Ukraine, there it's probably more obvious that, uh, there it's not so obvious rather that, that uh, it's not as obvious in the case of Israel, that Israel is uh, the victim because Israel is much freer country, much, much, uh, much less corrupt than Ukraine has a longer history of standing with the West on Western principles. Ukraine's rel rel relatively recent to this game. So the fact that they are so in uh, to opposing Russian aggression, but not Hamas, is another revealing sign of a kind of double standard. Um, and as, it's, as we see this in the American political scene, there's also the apparent double standard of caring much more about uh, harassment and intimidation of Palestinians who on occasion uh, are, are targeted. Uh, no similar concern for Jews. That's what the, the whole scandal on American campuses has been about. That's what the congressional hearings were about. People saw that there was that kind of uh, double standard. And I think that when you're talking about the leadership of these movements, what this really reveals is that there's really a different principle that's motivating them than the one that they profess uh, to uh, be motivated by. They're motivated by an egalitarian standard where uh, there's a hatred of ability and only concerned for the victims. But if you're talking about the followers of these leaders, people who maybe don't think so much about why they're in what, why they're involved in the cause that they're getting involved in, there I think that it's really simply they are being pulled by a tribe. They're not thinking about any principle. And that's why they are willing to follow these leaders, even when there's no coherent principle that accounts for at least the followers' own political stances. I think that's true of many of the people with the different flags on social media. What ties this all together on Israel, especially if we're talking about the left and their opposition to Israel, is an overall emotionalistic stance and framing to the issue. There's not rational argument. There's simply showing of pictures of victims, numbering the alleged dead according to the uh, Hamas health ministry, not thinking about what kind of context goes into this. And that's exactly what you would expect if 
the followers of this movement are, are basically following because of the emotional appeals of the leaders, uh, that they're much more concerned about, about wanting to uh, signal the, the right kind of allegiance and not wanting to uh, touch off the wrong emotions than they are about any kind of values or principles that are at stake. And let's make something clear here, Ben. When we judge someone as being tribalistic, it hasn't got to do with what position they hold. The main question is how did they reach that position? By what standard did they reach that position? And I will give an example about myself, how I judge myself being uh, tribalist in the past. I remember in the 2006 Lebanon war, I was a hundred percent with the side of whatever Israel side was, I was the, with the, the opposite. I remember I was vacationing in Crete and I was trying to see if there's any protest, a pro Hezbollah protest to, of, the, of, of the left in Greece to join. Now, how do I know I was tribalist? I had zero idea about the conflict. I couldn't even point to you where Lebanon is on the map. I, 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 it wasn't even clear in my mind what's the difference between Hezbollah and the Palestinians. But I knew one thing, our side back then, the, the Greek left, we are against Israel. So if someone is fighting Israel, I have to be with the other side. So I couldn't point to Israel on the map. I had no idea about the history, but I knew that my team had a clear position on that topic. So the problem was not that I was supporting the one side over the other. The problem was why did I support one side over the other? And let me give you a more recent example. For people who watched uh, the Tucker Carlson interview with Putin, at some point, Putin refers to the 99 war in Kosovo, where NATO bombed Serbia to allegedly to help the, the Kosovars. And Putin said something very interesting. When he explained why Russia helped Serbia, he said, Serbs are Orthodox, so we couldn't let our Orthodox brothers basically alone. Now, the very interesting thing here is that you could do various different criticism to the 99 NATO intervention in Kosovo. Was it the proper way of action? Did the United States have any interest in it? Did it improve the situation? So I can understand why someone would be a, with the Serb or would be critical of the US intervention. But the sole argument that Putin gives is that the Serbs are our Orthodox brothers. Now, this is tribalism. So the problem is not that he criticized the NATO intervention. Actually, there might be good grounds to criticize NATO intervention in Kosovo in 99, though this is not our topic today. The point is, the, the standard by which he support the one side was like, hey, Orthodox brothers, therefore, we're with you, not many questions asked. So this is the essence of tribalism, not which position you hold, but how did you reach that position? And something to bring out both about that point and about the uh, Israel Hamas example is, is something you, you briefly mentioned, but I want to really underscore it, which is that it's motivated by opposition to an enemy. So in mm -hmm. addition to being unprincipled, not there's no principle or value that's holding together the coalition, it's that there's nothing positive holding together the movement. It's, it's much more motivated by a negative. It's motivated by hatred for an enemy. And you see that on the Israel Hamas case, uh, in, the, in the Israel Hamas case, when you're talking about uh, opposition both to Israel and to the West more generally, of which it's seen, I think, as an example. And I think you also see it even in uh, something like the Yugoslav civil war. Russia probably didn't care so much about the Serbs. What they did care about was using it as an opportunity to, uh, to, to in some way or another, oppose the West. And the, you also mentioned, Nikos, the sort of national slash religious affiliation. And that's certainly... Uh, a dimension of the tribalism of these conflicts. And you, you see it even in the Israel Hamas case. Uh, somebody who's uh, religiously or nationally uh, closer to the Palestinians is more likely to support them against Israel. Likewise, there's tribalism, I think, in support of Israel. Uh, it's not simply that kind of tribalism. It's something that you see even in, let's say, the American context when we're talking about people who have no such uh, national or religious affiliations, but nonetheless come down on a in a political camp in a tribalistic way, because their camp is motivated, say, by opposition to Israel or by, again, hatred for America. And this is then used as an issue to, uh, as ammunition against their, their, their favorite enemy.
Um, it's something, by the way, that the Ayn Rand Institute, in taking its position in defense of Israel, has really tried to resist the pull of. That is, we're not doing it. We're not defending Israel on any kind of tribal ethnic grounds. It's, it's not that we have some special affinity uh, for the Jewish religion or for religion as such. It, it's because we see, we see Israel as one of the uh, uh, lone defenders of Western values in the Middle East, and that's the principle that we are that we are taking this position on the basis of. And actually, our final point today, Ben, is how does one actually choose who is which is the side more worthy supporting, if there is even a side worth supporting, in uh, in a, in a situation like. Uh, like the conflicts that we see these days. But we are going to keep this uh, principal point, let's say, for the end. So let's go to a second case study, Ben, that you have chosen, which is the border crisis. So where do you see the tribalism in the way we discuss the, the, the situation at the U.S. border? Yeah, I definitely think that this very hot political issue is highly tribalistic and we talked earlier about the toxicity of the general political atmosphere. You definitely see that on this issue I mean, to the point where some people lately on social media have started you know, recommending secession and civil war over this issue. That's when you start talking about that, it, that's about the, the, the furthest extreme to which you can push the tribalist mentality. And my point here is not even so much that there's a kind of racist or xenophobic element to opposition to Israel. I think there is that element, but that's not even what I'm going to comment on. It's again more about the way that the dialogue, the, the, the rhetoric on this issue is informed by pretty obviously tribalistic talking points and not by any kind of principled stance. And here it's important that obviously the latest opposition to immigration and uh, the concern about what's happening on the border, which is a real problem, comes from primarily the right from Republicans who were not always anti-immigration in the way that they were. And there are all kinds of clips of Ronald Reagan and George Bush from uh, George Bush, the elder circulating on social media over the last couple of years, showing just how dramatically different uh, conservatives and Republicans were on this issue just 10, 15 years ago. And it's not really obvious what kind of fact would have changed on the ground to cause this political change, uh, this change in political stance on behalf of conservatives. I mean, so you could say, for instance, well, things at the border have gotten worse and that's why they're noticing it. And it's true that there has been a record of border apprehensions, uh, a record setting number uh, in the past few years compared to very recent years. But if you go back far enough, you see that the crisis was just as bad. There were just as many apprehensions at the border in the early 1990s, early to mid 1990s. But when we think about the politics of that era, we do not think about that as the leading political controversy, even though it was you know, arguably as big of a problem. So what changed? It wasn't some fact on the ground that made it obvious to people only in recent years that this was a really big problem. And if you also look at the kinds of reasons that people give for being concerned about the border, you, it's still hard to find what exactly is the principle that's motivating them. So there's concern about immigrants taking welfare, but the people who are concerned about that don't speak out against welfare generally. They, they're not crusading for reform of the welfare state, for dismantling of entitlements. They're only concerned about it when immigrants uh, are the ones they can blame for the problem. Uh, if it's a national security issue, that they say is the reason to be worried about what's happening at the border. Over the last few weeks, we have had Iranian militant groups attacking American soldiers and bases in places uh, like uh, the, the Red Sea and, and in Jordan, killing American troops. And there's almost no discussion of this fact. The, the most obvious national security threat facing America today is coming from Iran, and it's almost a non-issue in the current political electoral season. There's been mention of it here and there, but it doesn't motivate controversy in the way that the border does. So again, it's not clear what principle is actually motivating people to use this as a political football. But again, we do see the emotionalism. We see the pictures of alleged caravans that are heading to the border, whether they end up getting there or not. 
we especially see extremely elevated uh, sensationalistic, emotionalistic language about the way the border problem is described. Uh, it's, this is why people are talking about secession and civil war, because they say what's happening is an, inv an invasion. They say that it was military aged men who are coming over the border, trying to stoke up fear uh, and hatred. And I mean, that's a clear sign of, of tribalism, especially again, to the extent that it's clear, it's more motivated by opposition to a negative than by any kind of positive value. And it's not just because uh, they see the foreigners as the enemies who are uh, a source of, of danger. It's, it's much more, I think, about the fact that the, the people on the right who make this an issue get to use it in order to target the left. They get to use it to try to explain it's the left that's to blame for this alleged invasion, and therefore they're the ones who need to be punished. Uh, it, the most obvious sign that this is the motivation, I think, is the recent political development in, in the United States where there was a border security bill that would have delivered most of the kinds of measures that conservatives were pushing for over the last five, seven years, and they were gonna get almost everything they wanted to, but the message went out, don't vote for this bill, don't support this bill, Republicans, because President Trump wants to be able to use it as an election <laughs> issue against Biden. And I mean, that's, that's clearly a case where you're much more concerned about opposing the enemy than you are about actually solving a problem. And that's a key technique that's used to whip up tribalistic, further, uh, tribalistic fervor. I'm going to take a a position on immigration. We've we've done it from a principled stance. We, but it's a place where the people who followed us on the Israel issue might not follow us along. And the question is why? And it it may be because they're they're either embracing the Israel cause for tribalistic reasons, or they're worried about the border uh, for tribalistic reasons. And my colleague Augustina Vergara Sid and I did an episode on this issue two months ago or so. Um, talking about the heated rhetoric over over the what's happening at the border. It's a real problem. Government needs to be uh, taking a position to solve it, but it's not an invasion. And that's really only tribalistic rhetoric. And here's a big problem when an important issue becomes another uh, uh, another field of struggle in the culture wars. We are losing the essence of the of the problem. So as you said, the situation in the border is very serious. But by making it this culture war tribal problem, we are pushing further and further away the solution. And we saw this in the in the example you gave with the with the, how the the Republicans uh, were motivated to to vote or not vote on this topic. But I'll bring another example: the issue of how the how many on the so-called new right dealt with the whole issue of the vaccines. So by creating all this uh, scare, fear mongering and conspiracy theories about the vaccines, which was 100% tribal, because when Trump pushed operation, uh, the operation to, to move the vaccines quickly out to, to people, they were supportive of it. So by their parania with the vaccines, we completely lost uh, the focus on the discussion that we should have, which is what should be the limits to what the government should be able to do to, and what are the measures it should be free or not free to impose on the population during an emergency. So instead of having a serious discussion about the lockdowns, we are having now the discussion that uh, vaccines were uh, experimental and uh, young people dropping like flies, quote unquote, and all that stuff. So the moment an important topic becomes this, this tool through which to, to strike to the other side, then unfortunately this important topic is becomes less it, it it kind of cheapens it so if you really care about what is happening in the border you should be very very serious on how you approach the topic rather than seeing it as oh there are going to be more uh, future voters of the democrats coming in or things like that but ben there's a third case study which we have some time to go through and i have to tell you when i saw it on on the schedule for today. And this is the topic of abortion. When I saw this on the agenda for today, I had these questions. I thought, why is abortion a tribal issue? Because to me, it looks like people who oppose abortion, they oppose it on a principle. They think that abortion is murder. Now, we could say they, they might be wrong, but 
this looks like a principled issue, right? I think mer abortion is murder, therefore murder is wrong. Or the people who support abortion, they say, I believe in bodily autonomy, I believe on the issue of individual rights, therefore I think that abortion should be legal. So is an abortion a clear issue where we have principal stance on the one side, principal stance on the other side, it just happens that one of the two sides, their approach is wrong. So I wanted to talk about this issue precisely for the reason that you raise, which is that this is a philosophical debate. And I would venture to say it's, it's one of the most philosophical controversies that is left on our political scene. What's revealing about looking at it is that even on this most philo philosophical controversy, there's real signs that it's been infiltrated by tribalistic elements. And that just, I think, shows the extent to which tribalism is operative in our political environment. Because, yeah, there are definitely people who are primarily motivated by religion or by secular philosophy uh, to take the stand that they take on this issue. And it, it's always been this way ever since this was an issue. But abortion has infiltrated the political sphere to the extent to an extent that I think is disproportionate to the actual um, ideological interests of many of the affected parties. And that's a sign that there's tribalism even here. And that just shows how uh, tribalistic this political culture is. And it, it matters because the whole composition of the American Supreme Court has now been skewed largely by this one issue. And here I want to highlight tribalism I see on both the right and the left about abortion. Um, you see it on the right, I think, even though that's where you would expect it to be philosophical because you'd expect people who oppose abortion to be driven by religion. And I think at the top of uh, you know, the leadership of that movement is very often driven by religion, but the way that they've gained supporters and the allies they've made uh, in trying to push their issue has has been taken up in a tribalistic milieu. So how many people who are motivated by the abortion issue really care about babies? You don't see them crusading for government-sponsored prenatal and childcare. Uh, so they, they, and this is a point that the left often makes, which I think is valid, that they, they care a lot about the, about the fetus until it's born. Uh, but they don't care so much about the child afterwards. So that makes you wonder what principle really is moving them, especially if you think about, can you actually really care uh, about an embryo in the way that one could care about a child? If the concern is about uh, the death of innocent young humans, what about school shootings? Why don't they seem to care about taking any kind of action against those in the way that they do uh, about stopping abortion. This is again a point that the left makes about the right, which I think is not wrong. Or if you think about the issue of abortion from a constitutional perspective, if you think that's the principle that motivates them, that, that it was a it was a bad that Roe v. Wade was a bad constitutional decision, they'll say there's no right to abortion in the Constitution, uh, none that's mentioned explicitly. This is the way that it was argued in the Dobbs v. Jackson case. Well. Um, take an issue that's related to school shootings, which is gun rights. I mean, AR-15s aren't mentioned in the Constitution either. There's about the uh, equal amount of literality between both the uh, uh, right to have an abortion and the right to own an AR-15. Uh, if you want to protect either of those rights, you have to go to a general principle. They weren't willing to look for a general principle that would cover it in the case of abortion, but they, they were happy to include AR-15s under a principle to defend uh, the right to own them. And that I see as a general lack of principled thinking. You're not, you're not using the same degree of abstract principle to defend the right or to see how a right can be defended. Then you're really much more motivated by the concrete issue. And then there's the question about why are you motivated by the concrete issue? Is it simply because everybody around you is really trying to pull you into taking a stand on the issue and doing it by means of obvious emotional manipulation, which is clear in the case of abortion, where it's much more likely for people to show pictures of aborted fetuses uh, than it is to actually make an argument for why fetuses actually deserve a right, why they have a right, why they are individuals who have rights, which I mean, I don't think that they do. I think that the tribalistic element of this is coming from the fact that, that, that the right wants to make the left look like baby killers. They want to use it as, again, 
um, a, a way to bash their political opponent. And one piece of evidence for this is that when it looks like it's not working anymore, they stop talking about the issue. And that's been especially evident in the last couple of years of elections where it's looked like abortion is a losing issue for the right, that the more abortion becomes an issue, the more referendums uh, there are in different states like Kansas and Ohio. It looks like even right-wing voters don't want to outlaw abortion. Suddenly the right drops it. Suddenly they stop making it part of their political campaigns. Uh, if they were really principled about it, if the majority of these politicians were principled about it, you'd think they'd crusade on it even if they thought it was a losing issue politically. But it is a losing issue politically. So that's a sign that they don't really care about it on a principled level. Of course, the hardcore abortion activists are still, uh, anti-abortion activists are still at it, but they're not the politicians who are leading these, um, these campaigns. You also see, I think, tribalism on the left about abortion. And this is something I say, even though I'm on record as being a pretty vocal defender of abortion rights, there aren't too many principled allies out there to find on this issue. It's clear why this is the case. They'll talk a lot about choice. They'll talk a lot about reproductive freedom. But if they're on the left, they don't seem to care too much about choice or freedom on any other important political topic, whether it's economic freedom or freedom of speech. Uh, the, the reproductive freedom seems to be the only freedom that the left cares about. And so that's a sign, again, that it's not a principle that they really care about. It's not a value that they're really working to uphold. And this, I think this became especially obvious uh, during COVID when many on the left came out in favor of not just voluntarily taking the COVID vaccine, but actually making it politically uh, obligatory, making it mandatory, forcing people by force of law to take it where there's a clear bodily autonomy issue at stake, which you'd think that if they cared about as a matter of principle, um, they wouldn't have done that because it would have been blatantly, blatantly in contradiction with their abortion stance. And many, pe many people on the right, I think, pointed this out, and I think they were right to do that. It's a sign that the left doesn't really care that much about reproductive freedom or about freedom more generally. Instead, uh, many of them, at least the followers in the movement, not necessarily the leaders, not necessarily all the most ardent advocates, but many of them are, are pulled into this, again, by means of emotion, by, um, by means of uh, life stories about the women who need abortions. And that's a relevant kind of story to tell if you're arguing for abortion rights. But you, you shouldn't do it to the exclusion of making principled arguments, principled arguments on the basis of what rights do individuals really deserve, what makes someone an individual who has rights. It's the kind of philosophical defense that the left has been very hesitant to give, which is part of the reason it's been hard for me to get some of my principled arguments published by left-wing outlets. And here again, I think it's, it's more about opposing a certain kind of enemy. It's more about being able to target the right, uh, being able to oppose the patriarchy. Abortion on the left is, is generally seen in, as a women's issue. It's, it's, defined here by membership in a tribe, in a, a kind of gender tribe, uh, where one tribe, uh, the female tribe is pitted against the patriarchal male tribe. And this issue is then used as, as a kind of uh, totem uh, in order to whip up fervor. And which is, again, I think really unfortunate because it's a, there's a, a really philosophical issue here. There needs to be a discussion about and so little of that discussion actually happens in public where it should be happening. And I think that's because the different tribal leaders are just using it to, to divide people and to lower the level of discourse. Well, it's, it's such a complicated issue, Ben. But I, I think that at least the religious people on the right, I think they mean it when they say, that no, this is a, this is this is an issue of individual of individual rights. And my other comment would be that also the people in the left who attack them, for example, you don't care about babies after they're born, or what would you do about school shootings? I think these these are tribal attacks for a very simple reason because they do, they cannot suggest a solution. So okay, what what would the left do about school shootings? We've we've heard about this for ages. So anyway. That we could be discussing this for the next 30 minutes, but let's try to answer now a question which is which goes beyond the concrete, be, be, which goes beyond the case studies, which is why is it that in this particular intellectual atmosphere we see tribalism being at this high level? We we shouldn't say at the peak, because 
we've seen throughout human history that tribalism has reached murderous levels. It hasn't been that many decades since we had the we had the genocides based on whether is someone part of the tribe of the of the Tutsis or the Hutus. So we, we've seen tribe we've seen worse type of tribalism. But still, we see today in the West that tribalism is at a relevant high point. So we need to ask the question: Why now? And for me, the answer is simple. We live in times where our capacity to make sense of the world is questioned and it is questioned by different points of attack. For example, we have people who are determinist, who actually tell us you don't really have free will. We have people who are telling us you don't make sense of the world as an individual, but you make sense of the world based on your environment or based on your group. Where all these people agree is that you cannot really be sure that you can make sense of the world. We keep this. This is one given in today's life that our capacity to make sense of the world is question. A second thing that I see happening is that we are bombarded with this idea that there are many dangerous issues. There are many dangers out there. It could be capitalism. It could be climate change. It would be the great replacement, it could be racism, it could be the, the deep state. We are constantly told that there's a danger hiding behind every corner. Now, if you put these two things together, we cannot make sense of the world as individuals. And the world is a dangerous place. It creates an explosive mix. And it is a mix that tells us that you are left without a navigating instrument in a very, very dangerous environment. In, I, I, imagine, imagine this, you're like, you, you, you are in a, in a dark castle and you're trying to find your way without actually being able to see. This is a very scary place to be. So when the world becomes this scary place, the result has to be some existential angst, some, some existential fear. It's, it's, I always comes to my mind this painting, the screen. There's someone who is in a world which is very inhospitable. So what do you do in this case? You need security in the group. I cannot make sense of the world. The, go the world is a dangerous place. I need to find other people to join hands with them so that maybe this world now becomes a bit more hospitable. And these are people who are going to look like me, people of the same race, of the same gender, or people with whom I have the same enemies, people who hate the things I hate. And this is the tribal affiliations of today. It's like someone who is blind is joining other people who are blind. And then at the end of the day, no one can see. So no one is better off. It's like I cannot think, so I will let the thinking to other people. But of course, we know other people cannot think or for us. Ayn Rand put it in the same way that other people cannot digest your food for you, other people cannot uh, think for you. So this is why I think tribalism is such a big issue today, is because we live in a world that we, the, our main instrument of making sense of it, our main instrument of agency, our reasoning mind and our free will are under attack. Yes, and I think the, the, the kinds of factors that you just cited, Nikos, help explain uh, tribalism at root by means of a certain kind of mindset, as you put it. And the fact that the kinds of, is so related to fear and motivation by fear is important here to understand what the mindset is. On the one hand, there's fear of a certain, uh, certain kinds of factors in your environment. There's a reason why I highlighted all the emotionalistic appeals of these different tribalistic movements. They will point to the more immediate, the more perceptual level kinds of threats. So not even something as obvious as Iranian terrorists uh, and militants who are trying to kill us because, well, they're overseas, they're very far away, but point to the people coming across the border of your country, even though they don't have guns even though they're not attacking anyone, but they're, they look a little different. They're coming across the border in your own state, maybe. 
very close to your concerns and very close to closer to your, what you can immediately see. Uh, understanding that something like Islamic totalitarianism is a threat is a much greater intellectual achievement. You have to study a lot of cases, see what they have in common with each other, understand something about their motivation, that they, they uh, it's not just that you're getting in their way, but that they, they hate certain kinds of values that you stand for. That's something that takes a more abstract philosophical perspective, a more principled perspective. So on the one hand, tribalism is encouraged by the fact that people analyze threats in this more sensationalistic, emotional, less intellectual way. And it also is, the fear also arises because, and you hinted at this, I think somewhat Nikos in the way we're told that our, our mind is impotent. You're also going to be afraid, not just because these threats have been described in an emotionalistic way, but if you yourself have lost the confidence of your own mind and therefore don't think you can really understand what kind of world you're living in and are therefore driven into a kind of tribal group out of security. And what's common to both of these sources of fear, the fear of the immediately threatening factors and the fear that comes from losing confidence in your own mind, both of them come from what Ayn Rand called the anti-conceptual mentality, uh, from the way in which our culture has disincentivized thinking in conceptual principled terms. Some of it is a result of just philosophical trends where there's been explicit assault on the efficacy of reason, on uh, the ability to know things about the universe. Some of it comes, and it's not unrelated to the philosophical trend, but some of it comes just from the failure of our education system to uh, to develop young minds, to know things about the world, and to want to learn more. Uh, when through one means or another, people abandon conceptual methods as a, as a way of understanding the world around them, they're driven then to seek security in people who look like them, people that are familiar with them, but people who they recognize from having grown up, not necessarily people who are uh, teaching abstract ideas that they find unfamiliar and challenging. Uh, all of this then is also further incentivized by the fact that we, we live in an increasingly collectivistic political system. When through one arbitrary uh, justification or another, a group of people is sacrificed to another people, uh, another group of people, uh, sacrificed in the name of the public good, sacrificed in the name of the common uh, welfare, but what's really happening is, is one group is being sacrificed to another. You see this in various debates about the welfare state. You see this in debates about the regulatory state. People have the sense, I'm being put into a group by collectivists and sacrificed to another group. Well, I better join together then out of some kind of self, in order to get protection. Uh, and when nobody is offering an individualistic alternative, when nobody is advocating policies that would help us unshackle ourselves from other people uh, so that we wouldn't be sacrificed by uh, policy measures, then tribalism looks like the only solution. But Nikos, as we stressed in the title of this episode, tribalism looks like a solution, but in fact, nobody wins in these kinds of tribal political battles. That's especially the case if what's motivating these battles is not any kind of effort to uphold or defend a positive value, but just a motivation to destroy other people, just motivation by fear of a negative. You can't win a battle if there's nothing positive to actually win, if you're not fighting for something positive. If you're just looking for ways to knock down errors and evil, you're not thinking about how can we create the good. And I mean, that is, I think, one of the biggest problems with current political controversies. There's so much uh, there's so much more about smashing the other side, so much about burning it all down, than they are about trying to build anything. And if you don't try to build anything, then you'll have defeated your opponent, but you'll be left with nothing. And that's no solution. That's, no, that's not winning. At the end, we all lose then. And uh, last point I would say is that thinking is a habit. If you think in a tribalistic way, i.e. in a wrong way, or put differently, if you avoid thinking, this will soon spill over also in your own life. I, I know 
people who are doing mistakes in their private life that are spillovers for their tribal for the tribalistic way they view the world. A simple example is now they're very uh, they, they, they don't trust, quote, the science or, quote, big pharma. And it's not only on the issue of uh, the vaccine, it's on other issues, as, for example, oh, you know, big pharma is giving us too many medicines. Therefore, when my doctor suggests this medicine, I'm not going to take it. So at the end of the day, tribalism is a way of thinking, and we see it playing out in the big on the big stage, which is politics, but... Behind it, it also plays out in people's life because at the end of the day is a mindset, is a way people think. Before we suggest some sources, let me say a big thank you to two of our uh, loyal uh, audience, Maria Len and Jonathan. Many thanks for your contributions. They are highly, highly appreciated. Now, let's see. People who want to read more and understand more about oh, tribalism, Nikos, understand more how Nikos, tribalism opens. Nikos, yes. Before we before we do the resources, we should still do the talk about ARI's approach to this issue. Oh, sorry, of course. Uh, and then we of can, course. Yeah, uh, because part of the reason we did this episode uh, is not just to comment on the issue itself, but to to shed a little light on the way that. ARI approaches this issue when we look at any of the political controversies we comment on. And I think this is something that distinguishes us. And, and I want to give our audience more insight into the reason that we choose to talk about the kinds of issues that we do choose to talk about. I mean, so how do we think about tribalism? Well, first of all, we work to identify it wherever it is at work in different political controversies. We analyze it. We criticize it as we're doing in this episode. But it's not just that. It informs the way we the way we think about and talk about the issues that we do actually comment on. So we, we often get uh, messages from people saying things like, why don't you guys comment on X? Why don't you comment on Y? And there are, sometimes uh, it's simply because we don't think we have expertise on the topic. And we don't want to pretend that we have expertise uh, just because a lot of people are talking about it and because a lot of people are really encouraging us to get involved in this fight. We want to know something about the issue before we comment on it. We want to study it. We want to research it and then try to offer an obje a distinctively objectivist position if we think there is one, uh, if we think there's a position nobody else is taking, because that is that is our mission to spread awareness of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. The third thing I would say about our approach to tribalism is that when we do actually uh, comment on political controversies, we do it by taking a principled approach. Uh, we do it by looking at how principles of reason, individualism, and capitalism actually reflect on the issue when we've studied it and understood it as well as we can. And if it turns out that both sides of the political spectrum are, if their positions are both in violation of that principle, then we argue that both sides are wrong. Uh, and even if one of the sides takes the kind of formally, ostensibly correct position, but we think they're doing it for the wrong reason, which is often the case, for instance, I think, with, uh, with the abortion controversy, the way that the left approaches it is usually wrong. We don't see them then as allies. We don't think of the, these guys are on our side. We, we think they're, you know, they've accidentally uh, the, gotten the, the, the right idea. The, even a stopped clock is right twice a day, as they say, but that's not really being right. So we don't see them as allies. And when we are often encouraged to think that no we're wrong to think both sides are wrong one of them is worse than the other we're pretty reluctant to be pulled into that when we think that the reasons being given for seeing one side as worse is are, are themselves being influenced by tribalistic rhetoric uh i could go into details on that but i won't for now i think it might have once been the case that one side of the political spectrum was better than the other. I, I think it's very hard to argue that now. I think you only think that if you're kind of paying attention to the propaganda of one side as opposed to the other. And I also think it's easy to think that you yourself are not being tribalistic, that you, you are a principled individualist. Uh, it's easy to think that and to be that way, but to still be affected by the in effect, propaganda of one tribalistic camp or the other 
especially, you know, depending on how you get your news. Since news has become so tribalistic, uh, it's easy to be immersed in a certain kind of viewpoint from one tribe, not even realize that it's happening to you. Uh, and we work very hard to try to escape from that pull. But it's important, I should stress, and it should be clear from some of the case studies that we've looked at today, that, that refusing to stand with one tribe or another does not mean refusing to take a stand. We've taken a very principled stand on, in favor of Israel. We've taken a very principled stand in favor of abortion rights. And uh, that's in spite of the fact that we are not standing with necessarily uh, all the people who are usually on that side of the position because they don't always have our, they don't always share our principles. And that's an important point to make. It's the end of the day. It's again, what is your guiding principle? Are you reality first, principle first, or group allegiance first? Now, further sources on the topic of tribalism. Actually, Ayn Rand wrote about uh, tribalism before it was uh, cool. So an essay that we would suggest is Global, Global Balkanization. It's from The Voice of Reason, but you can find it online at bit.ly slash global bulk. You can see also the, the link here on the screen. So this is, this is an essay which is, is when, when I read it, I started understanding what is happening. It, it was a key moment for me in figuring out, yes, the common denominator on the many things that I see happening in the world is actually tribalism. There's also another source is a talk about that Ben gave in a conference some years ago. And let's go to the next slide, please. It's tribalism in today's political culture. You can find that bit.ly slash tribalism today. And actually, Ben has, I will suggest another talk that he gave in Prague on tribalism, which was also very good. So there are at least two very good talks by Ben in Bing conferences on tribalism. And also I've written a book on tribalism. It's called Identity Politics and Tribalism, the New Culture Wars. You can find it on Amazon. Now, I wrote this book before, uh, when my understanding of objectivism was relatively uh, poor and uh, w w not as not that today it's great but it was it was less mature than today but still i think it's it's a good book when it comes to understanding tribalism it takes the various examples of tribalism in the world out there the free speech war the gender wars the racial war so to speak and it tries to find the common denominator and it tracks the tribal history of the left and the tribal history of the right so these are some sources to dive deeper into the topic of tribalism. Again, it will offer you a new prism in viewing the current political debates and the current political atmosphere. So I don't think there's any other source. So if you want us to, oh, there is one actually source. The, it's the essay, The Missing Link by Ayn Rand from 1973 on again, explaining what is the mentality? What is the mindset of someone who is a tribalist. It's what she calls the anti-conceptual mentality. Read this essay and you'll get a better insight into the mind of a tribalist. You can find it at bit uh, at sorry bit.ly slash feel who needs it. So most of Ayn Rand's essays, you can find them online and on the Ayn Rand campus. This for one future I can say episodes, is not actually it? online, but that's the website for getting the book Philosophy Who Needs It that it appears in. Oh, okay. 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 So if you want us to cover more relevant topics with politics or any topic that you think might be of interest, you can drop us an email at newideal uh, at einrand.org. And remember, we have a new series where you can ask specific philosophical questions and someone from the faculty are going to reply to this question based on their expertise. As Ben said, we don't talk about topics we don't understand because we have respect to ourselves and to you. So we do these episodes bi-weekly and you can send your questions at experts at einrand.org. So again, this is about questions on specific questions related to objectivism or, or what is the objectivist take on one particular 
topic. I think that is all. Remember to follow us and to, if you appreciate our work, to share it. It helps a lot. So many thanks for your time. Many thanks for watching. Thanks to Ben who suggested this important topic. All the best.